Hey, this is Raja Kumari. I am a fusion artist, songwriter, rapper, and I'm actually about to start my North American tour. So please come out and check out my music. But right now, you got me on Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing. Yeah. My name is Abhay Dandekar, and I share conversations with talented and interesting individuals linked to the global Indian and South Asian community. It's informal and informative, adding insights to our evolving cultural expressions, where each person can proudly say, trust me, I know what I'm doing. Hi, everyone. On this episode of Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing, we reconnect with singer, artist, and performer Raja Kumari. Stay tuned. I want to offer my genuine thanks to everyone for listening and subscribing to Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing and sharing it with your friends and family and for following us on social media. And again, if you're enjoying these conversations, please take a moment to submit a kind rating and review wherever you might be listening or watching as it's truly, truly appreciated. Now, I've been thinking a lot these days about the relationship between peace and power in that I've often found my most peaceful moments are actually ones where I'm not only feeling blissful and with great clarity, but that I'm also feeling deeply empowered and almost invigorated to tackle any challenge. I for one know that these moments can be quite fleeting, and I often will yearn for something to either speed up or slow down life's pace to find that great resting spot of peace and power. And in a way, it's almost like it's helpful to keep reminding myself that the peace unlocks the power and vice versa. And just as we had left off after a conversation a few years ago, this is squarely where we find hip hop artist, singer, and performer Raja Kumari. She was born Sveta Yalapragada Rao in Claremont, California, and grew up incredibly rooted in Indian culture with classical Indian music as a soundtrack and intensive training in Bharatnatyam, Kathak, and Kuchipuri. At 14, Sveta started performing as a hip hop artist under the name Raja Kumari, rapping and writing her own songs and learning and then collaborating with Timbaland, Dr. Dre, Gwen Stefani, Fifth Harmony, and Iggy Azalea. Along the way, she's released a number of hit singles and EPs and moved to Mumbai to concentrate on professional work as well as interests in philanthropy and mentoring other artists. This past year, she's shared the stage with John Legend and collaborated on a variety of projects with the likes of Shah Rukh Khan, Aniruddha Ravichandar, Madhuri Dixit, and Sushmita Sen. After forming Godmother Records, her own independent music label a few years ago, she's now released her latest work this past spring, a feature album called The Bridge. We caught up recently just as she was about to embark on her North American tour and chatted about everything from spiritual reset moments to different artistic personas and to what she's searching for both personally and professionally. And as I've been listening to Raja's music lately, we started also by talking about some of her recent reflections and looking toward the end of the year. It's definitely different each year. I think it has to do with like what you've been through. Like it's always this time where you get to come back to the center. You like come back to your roots. Like I, if I'm in India, I try to go to Hyderabad and meet my grandma. She's, you know, the, the elder, the final elder, the one that has all the ancestral knowledge and blessings. And, yeah. um, but for me, it's been an interesting, you know, few months. I am about to start the North American leg of my tour, which, mm. um, you know, begins in Canada, goes through America. It's 10 cities. And it's the biggest, you know, um, thing I've taken on. Like there's like two rounds, like there's two stretches that are three shows, three nights, which yeah. the last time I did three shows, three nights, I was 14 years old. It was the Millennium Dance Festival. And it was such a huge undertaking i did three shows three nights three different styles and i remember like just how much it took out of me and i have two rounds of that in this so mm. i am you know i'm definitely excited and looking forward to you know kind of having this homecoming but prior yeah. to this um i actually was supposed to start the tour in india and yeah. there was some complications 
with things that are outside of me that I cannot control. And I took it pretty hard because, um, you know, originally I'm very symbolic as an artist. So originally it was beginning in Hyderabad and ending in Los Angeles, which to me was mm. like very symbolic of my journey. And, yeah. you know, I had made this whole thing about it and made T-shirts. Like I have merch with like the Indian cities and then the American cities. And I'm like the tour that never was. <laughs> so I took it. I took it pretty hard uh, with the reschedule. Now it's going to be on the top of next year. Um, in yeah. India after the U.S. tour, but I took it pretty hard, and I actually ended up going on the yatra. I went to Kedarnath um, mm -hmm. about two weeks ago, and that was a really, like, it was a super important, like, I just felt like I needed to ground myself, and whenever I'm in India, I never have time to, like, actually go to temples or, like, take yeah. time to myself. It's, like, always, like, a full schedule when I'm here, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I think Diwali was just like an important time to reflect on all the growth and all the blessings and also all the things that I have survived through all the darkness that I've triumphed over. Right. You know, like I think it was a very, very different type of Diwali for me. I, and my parents are back in the U S and, you know, I think it's been also accepting that, you know, I've been in India for seven years now and I've kind of made my own life here and I've made yeah. my own family and my own friends and, you know, going to Hyderabad and, just being with the whole Telugu film industry, like, you know, the fact right. that they, like, those are my friends there. I think I've just kind of, this Diwali, I feel like I've accepted that I, I like, love living in India. And this is, like, a life that I've kind of made for myself versus one that was given to me. You know, you, it's, it's funny you mentioned that you've grown to, in fact, embrace this part of yourself. It's, it's, it's we were just talking about feeling at home, right? And, you know, that sense of feeling at home is not always easy to come by, but it's the same thing when you have setbacks, when there are things that don't necessarily go as planned. And, you know, for you, like now thinking about this stage in your career and sort of where you're at personally, professionally, how it all integrates, do, do you find yourself dealing with setbacks and mistakes and failures differently than you had in the past? I'm so happy like um, that I've come to this place now because, you know, you can read all those like quotes online and you can like repost <laughs> them and like, but they have to like integrate into you. And I feel yeah, like- Yeah, you got to execute them. Yeah, like I feel like um, this was not like a setback. It was like a redirection. Like I totally, yeah. after going to the Kedarnath temple, taking that yatra 10 days into like the heart of the Himalayas and like standing outside the temple that the Pandavas built, you know? Right. I just feel like it was so important to go have that experience to dip in the Ganges again. You know, 20 years yeah. ago, I dipped in the Ganges. I went with my parents when I was younger. And I remember, I think it was like, I, I know I'm dating myself now, but I don't care. But I was just, I just started college and um, yeah. I dipped in the Ganges and I started my company, my music company, and it's called Ganges Flow Music. Mm. So the Ganga has always been like a very important symbolic part of my music. And I think when this tour you know, got postponed and a lot of things about like my career and kind of this desire to just like, I need people to understand me. I feel like a lot of that left me when I went to the Ganges, like I dipped in mm. the Ganges and I just understood that it's not in my hands. Yeah. Like I surrendered a lot. Like when I yeah. went there, I surrendered a lot of things that I've been pushing, pushing, pushing. And I think like, if I'm supposed to be, you know, some enormous superstar on the side, see, the thing is success is so relative, right? Like yeah. someone yeah. can look at my career and be like, oh my God. And I'll look at Taylor Swift's career and be like, oh my God. You know, yeah. like there's always going to be like Beyonce, Taylor Swift. And I just realized like, you know, like there's so much support for me. And yeah. honestly, I'm so happy where I am. Like, you know, I feel like people are always like, you need to be bigger. You need to be bigger. And I'm like, I don't even know what that means. Like, yeah. If God wants me to be on a bigger stage, I think he will make it happen. Like if he wanted me to have that kind of impact, then he'll open the doors for me. And it's not, that's not saying that I won't do the work. Like I'll constantly make the music, I'll stay connected, sure. you know, I'll do those things. But this idea of America versus India, I don't know. I think I'm settling into this space where I'm like, I just want to be where I'm happy. I wonder also if it's somewhat liberating to feel content. It's not a, a, a mock on your or a mark on your achievement or on your yeah. drive, 
But the fact that you to say that you're content, um, it's almost it's almost liberating to say that, look, it doesn't mean that I'm any less of an achiever. Yeah, like I'm just happy. Like, I think I, I t- I'll share this story with you. So I was going through a lot like in my mind about like, you know, like a lot of times my American team will be like, you're not in America. If you were in America, you would have more success and you'll have more right. of this. And then I'm like, how do I explain to them that I just like there's something that feels different for me when I'm in India? And yeah. um, I was going to this temple that was like super remote. It's called Triyugi Narayan. And it's where mm. Shiva and Parvati were married. Okay. Yeah. And I have, you know, sacrificed a lot in my life and focused on my career and like pushing the diaspora forward and the message and right. all these things that I haven't really focused on a personal life. I'm not married. I don't have kids. And like, yeah. it's obviously something that I want in my life. So I went to this temple and I was like, I'm going to go where Shiva and Parvati were married. I'm going to get the blessings and it's going to happen for me. Yeah. And I remember when I was driving on this like 30 kilometers of this like tiny road that like, you know, it's like certain death and then like mudslide. And it's like, <laughs> you know, like they like yeah. built this temple in the middle of nowhere. Like you have to trust God to go up there because at any right. moment, I said to my friend, I had a friend, Shui, who was visiting from, um, she was visiting from Sedona and she's like a healer. And so we were like yeah. having these deep conversations. And I told her, I said, you know what? If I go to this temple, all the way at this temple, and somebody knows who I am, then I will know that my music is pervasive, that it has gone right. where it needs to go. Because right. the thing that people will say to me to try to break me is like, oh, you can't sell tickets. You can't sell tickets. Yeah. You feel like people aren't coming. And I'm like, it's just such a bizarre concept because I see my impact. I feel it when I meet people. Yeah. But like, I don't know how to convert it into some American idea of like data and ticket sales, right? So I'm sitting, I'm doing the puja. And I just hear someone go, there's like maybe six, seven people at this temple. It's not like yeah. Kedarnath where there's hundreds of people. There's like right. seven people at this temple. Yeah, okay? tiny. Like I, like I went to seek this temple out, you know? Yeah. And I'm doing the puja and I just hear my name, Raja Kumari. And I just turned. And the temple was, was behind it. him. Yeah. And I just understood. It was like, oh my God, this is so crazy. And then I ended up meeting that same fan at every darshan. Like every temple I went to, he was there. And it was like this reminder. And then... I kind of understood. I think it was the most like powerful kind of understanding about who I am and where my music is when I was going up to Kedarnath. Okay. So you yeah. have to like go to this place called Gorikun, Sonbrayag, which is the last place you can go with a car. Then you sure. have to take a 14 kilometer trek, which is actually 20. You can either walk it, you can take the horses, it can be carried. And on my way up, I had to, I, like, I was recognized 40, 50 times. Like, people were taking selfies with me on the horse and I have no makeup on. And I understood. Yeah. I was like, yo, my fans, they're not at the club. They're at the Monday. Yeah. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. Like, and it was such a huge revelation because I don't think anybody can hurt me now with that statement. Cause I'll just be like, no, you just, you have a low frequency uh, location and my fans, people who love me, they're on a higher frequency and I have to find them. And I wonder if it's like empowering to know that the framework by which you measure either success or recognition or like that people are like, you know, hey, we we know who you are. Your art speaks to us and where you find them, like if they're in an audience in a packed concert hall versus they're on the way to Kedarnath, like, you know, what what def, who defines that as being more or less successful where and how they actually demonstrate that you know what i mean yeah like success is so relative and it just kind of inspired me and like you know honestly when i'm doing my my tour i yeah. refuse to do it in clubs like i mean in america yeah. tour i'm i'm new i have to do what's given to me i'm going right, right. to work my hardest and i'm going to start over and you know sell yeah. my tickets but in India, when I return, I want to do only like theatrical venues. I'm taking yeah. my, my art directly out of the club. I'm removing it from there because yeah. when I was a child and I would do my classical performances, there'd be like Padma Shri gurus in the front row. And like, you know, like a lot of my fans, like the parents like the music, not just the kids. And it's like, I don't, I want, I want everybody to come because this music is about, you know, integrating all these emotions, the masculine, the feminine, yeah. the ancient, the future and you know, it's like it's done with a lot of heart and a lot of like devotion. Like I do yeah. truly believe that my art is an offering on the altar of Saraswati. And I kept saying that in all mm. my album stuff. But then if it's an altar to Saraswati, why am I putting it out at a club? It's okay. 
You know, I had a dream that one day I'll do Madison Square Garden and one day, you know, like yeah. they don't call it a staple center, you know, the cryptocurrency right. the crypto, center, whatever, yeah. whatever yeah. that it was. <laughs> you know, I have a dream, you know, that one day in my career that I would be at that level. And then, you know, but even in that dream, I was like, yeah, when I do those stadiums, like, you know, these places, I want to donate all the money from my LA show because it's my home show. So it's like, yeah. I know God knows that all of these dreams I have, they're integrated with giving back. So it's like, I know there's going to be pushback energetically from the world because what I'm trying to say is about unity. It's about acceptance. It's about loving yourself. And I think yeah. that that is a very courageous and bold idea in this current world, you know, and I, there's a lot of pushback, you know, from that. You know, when you think about the pushback that you get from these, you know, expectations, right. Yeah. And then you think about the acceptance and almost like camaraderie that you have from peers that yes. you collaborate with. And you've done a lot of that this year, right? So like, I mean, yes. I know you've worked with everyone from Shah Rukh Khan to Madhuri, of course, to yes. Sushmita Sen, John Legend, yes. Anirudh Ravichandar. I mean, like the, the list there is great. It's a big year, right? Yeah. And when you have that kind of peer-to-peer -peer acknowledgement, and, you know, in a way, like artists, there's a community there. You guys are, in, in a way, going through a lot of this together. How does being a fan, in some ways, kind of help in that collaboration process, or even sort of play a role, especially given what you just said, right? Where that, like, the measurement of who you are is yeah. sometimes determined by people who are not in that same room when you are collaborating with that person. I mean, the collaborations that I've been a part of this year have been, like, I think John was John Legend was the first one that like reminded me who I was because I kept reminding yeah. saying like, you know, I I hadn't been in a room with an American artist like that level for a long time. It was like Gwen Stefani was the last artist that I'd collaborated and written with. Yeah. And, you know, just walking into that room with an egot in the shadow of his like Grammys that are like above the piano, you know. Right. I just felt like I I belonged and we, you know, from meeting each other to getting to know each other, to writing and recording the song, it took four hours, Yeah, you know? And that just reminded me like what a talented songwriter I am and that I'm in these rooms for a reason. And that all those years that I was in those rooms that no one knew about was for moments like this, but I remain a fan of my mm. peers constantly. Like Shah Rukh, Madhuri, Sushmita, the whole time I'm like, I am here on behalf of the fans. We love you. <laughs> I've written this song on behalf of all the fans because we are obsessed with you, you know? Yeah. And I feel like I keep that part of me because, well, first off, I can't get rid of it. I'm just like a child right. that's, that's like enjoying. Natural, yeah. Yeah. Like I have a vision board with these people on it and now I'm living my vision. So like, I think that's the fun thing. Like, you know, whenever I'm around Madhuri, I always make her laugh because I'll just be like, well, since we're all obsessed with you, you need to do it this way because we want to see this angle, right. you know, like, so she yeah. just like enjoys being around me because I think it's like, it's very easy. But um, my peers have been, you know, so supportive and I get calls for collaborations out of nowhere where when I'm having like a dark time and like, you know, maybe I was feeling rejected from the hip hop community because I had stepped out of it or maybe certain decisions I had made to separate myself from people that yeah. were no longer, you know, on my frequency. But then there'll be like a collaboration like from Wazir that will call me to do this like gangster song or like yeah. this Kashmir record that I did right. a chorus on. You know, when I came in to see him, I've known him for 10 years and we just did this chorus and it became these like huge moments. So I just trust yeah. that all I need, like even the Aria song, you know, yeah. Sher Niai, it's in Hindi. Right. You know, right. and I came, I came home from, you know, from Kedarnath and my friend MC Heem, who is an incredible writer and he was on MTV Hustle the first season, but we were already friends. And um, he he works with the Dharavi Dream Project, which mm. I love, which is a school of hip hop in the slums of Dharavi. And he yeah. works with them. And, and I've actually been there and I've donated a bunch of equipment for their studio. And I'm like a mentor for the kids there. Yeah. So I called him and we wrote this song. And, and like when I came back from Kedarnath, it's like if you listen to it, it sounds like Sanskrit because like I yeah. came with that puja energy, you know. When it comes to the collaborators, I think like there's a lot of uh, mis interpretations of my character I feel like um yeah. from the west to the east like I think people in India have had more time to kind of like get to know me but mm. in the west I feel it's um the character I've created is is a little bit larger than um 
my personality sometimes because I think people are very confused when they meet me then I'm like this yeah well but <laughs> is that is that somewhat unfair just simply because of the scale of what who of what you are in some ways measured against right I mean like it, the, the west and it and you know what is expected and maybe kind of like what the platform what the floor and the ceiling are are just so different yeah. as far as context goes I feel like in the West, we have to placate, like, you know, we have to become like this token and we have to like, and then I think in the past, we used to be pitted against each other. And then there's yeah. like this elitist vibe and stuff. But I, I, I don't know. I feel one of the things that I hear that I'm, we're just being honest. And like, maybe yeah. if I'm, if I'm wrong, then maybe my fan, fans can come tell me that it's not this way and they can be part of my healing. But yeah. I'm always told that like the diaspora feels like I don't need them. Huh. And that's such okay. a weird feeling for me because like that I don't need them, that I have done all these things and I don't come back. And it's like, I have sacrificed so much to build this bridge because yeah. it was for all of us, you know? Right. And when I get these moments, you know, I feel like, I think maybe they saw my rise from Instagram versus in person where India kind of like got a chance to see me in a room with 200 people. But mm. by the way, at the Bridge World Tour, I am definitely doing menus with only 250 people. So you, you have go. the opportunity to come see me in a tiny room. I right. like, I always stay back. I meet everybody, you know. Yeah. I'm like here to do that. But I think like, I think it, it it's a little bit hurtful, like a little yeah. bit when, when like, because like you feel like, okay, I'm your, if I'm the mood board and yeah. you want to just take the ideas, but you don't. You, you, but I, but somehow I haven't done enough for you to like accept me. I just feel like it's almost like they are difficult. It's um, it's difficult for the investment to happen. And I wonder if for you, do you do you feel compelled in some ways? Like you mentioned, like there's the the two hundred person venue that it's almost necessary to have that kind of intimacy again with the diaspora. And find a way to, I wouldn't say reintroduce, but sort of no, for that is. authenticity to actually like be there. I actually do need to reintroduce it myself because I'm yeah. not the person who left America in 2016 with an American flag across my face talking right, about right. revolution. Yeah. You know, like I have grown so much. I've become a woman through all of this. Like I've learned yeah. so much about my life. And yeah. also I've learned so much about India. And I think like, you know, I hope to be that bridge for, for diaspora to understand India a little bit better because mm. I'll just mm. say this like and I'm not trying to be mean but I'm saying this as an educational thing I feel when sometimes people come to India like from the diaspora it's very much like a very take 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 thing like I'm gonna fill my suitcase with everything I can get I'm gonna take ideas I'm gonna meet yeah. you I'm gonna take pictures and then I'm gonna go and yeah. I feel like I wish that more people would come and invest their energy into collaborating with people here, leaving some of your energy. Cause like we got this opportunity to be born in some other place in order to bring those talents back and to collaborate with the people mm. here. So yeah. I feel like that energy is there a little bit. And I, I want the diaspora to understand that we are all connected. So like even inspiration, the like, you know, I think we need to be more connected. Like we need more understanding and we need more people to come spend time in their actual adulthood here and like talk to people that are their own age in India because the world is getting smaller. And if we're representing Indian culture in America, like there is a full country of people who are talented, outspoken. Like I just feel like sometimes like I really want to do things in the diaspora like I call this my homecoming tour and I and I really yeah. hope people come to like learn who I am but sometimes I feel that my value is is like more understood here because I can make an impact in a lot of ways like if I want to run a program about music education I can you, you know can. like I can right. make it happen and the consulate will be involved and like you know I just feel like I I, I dream of the day that I can have that kind of impact everywhere that when I want to speak about manifestation and culture that it's received, you know, in yeah. the way that I'm saying it and not through this like idea of, I think I'm better than everybody else. Cause I hang out with Shark Khan. It's like, right. no, I'm right. just a kid in a candy store and God yeah. said it was okay. Then every time I hug him, I go home and like, I'm like, oh my God, you know, like every time. 
Yeah, and, and you get that joy every single time, right? You're listening to Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing. After a quick break, let's come back to our conversation with Raja Kumari. Stay tuned. Every story told is a lesson learned, and every lesson learned is a story waiting to be told. I'm Abhay Dandekar, and I share conversations with global Indians and South Asians so everyone can say, trust me, I know what I'm doing. New episodes weekly, wherever you listen to your podcasts. Hi, this is Madhuri Dixit, and you're listening to Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing with Abhay Dandekar. Hello, everyone. My name is Tam France. Hi, guys. I'm Ananya Pandey. Hi, my name is Richa Morjani, and you're listening to Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing with Abhay Dandekar. You're listening to Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing. Let's rejoin our conversation now with rapper, artist, and singer, Raja Kumari. I, I wonder one thing, I mean, you tell, you're telling this story, and I'm hearing so much kind of like self-reflection and self-awareness in your voice when when you're talking about building community, getting more, yeah. being more collaborative, showcasing that and giving as opposed to, you know, like you said, sort of like you go and you play tourist and, and it's take, take, take. Ha, has that sentiment especially as you've collaborated, especially when it's now reflecting on things like, you know, the bridge and Sherniai and Jawan. And has that growth also been reflected for you now as a songwriter? Like, have you taken that spirit of saying, look, it isn't just, you know, take, take, take. There is a lot of community building to do. There is a lot of collaboration to do. Oh. You know what I, I mean? Just, I just noticed it recently, like, when I started, I would talk about like mango this and curry this and right. like masala. And that was like a big part of my lyrical content. And now it's like, it's not there really, unless it's like a really funny thing I just have to say. But like, yeah. I realize I've grown so much when it comes to talking about identity, where like yeah. my idea of my identity was different when I was coming from, you know, just being in America. And I think like the last seven years, consistently being in India, much to the chagrin of my American team, because they're like, yo, if you're in America for what one week. What are you doing? Right? Yeah, the second I land in America, like, I think it's like, I always get some like ridiculous contract. And then everyone is like, do you see what happens when you're here? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. bye. And then I just yeah. go back to India because I like being in India. Do you, Is it an escape for you, by the way? I mean, like, do you feel like, hey, I, you feel trapped sometimes when you're no, when you're not no. in India? Oh, okay, that's a good question. I don't feel trapped. I just feel like, you know, more and more in life, I feel like I'm just kind of floating around as this very unique energy and I'm looking for others that share the same frequency. And sometimes sure. when I get to America, I feel like America is in this really special place right now where South Asians are getting their shine for the first time. And when Saturday Night Live doesn't even put Indians in as the Indian people that we have like a right to say right. something, you yeah. know, and it's this very like time period to fight for what we believe in. And, and I, and I totally love that and relate to that. I just feel like when I'm in India, I don't have to do any of that. Yeah. Like, I yeah. just feel like my identity is just kind of understood and, and I, and I will, I definitely want to fight for things. I just feel like my fighting time is done now and I want to be Shanti and I want to be receiving. And, you know, like we said earlier, like I kind of like forego a lot of the typical things people do. And now I've like woken up on the other side of this decision and realized that I don't have a husband. I don't have kids. And I'm not saying that's the end all be all, but yeah. I think my, my genes should continue. I think yeah. I would raise really, really like smart boys and like cultured girls that would like contribute to society you know like yeah. it's that you know so I think like chasing and fighting I'll be there when needed you call me I'll come like my shasar Madhani cut people's heads off yeah, right. whenever they need me I'll come in there but yeah. I feel in India that I have a sense of peace and it's weird because my whole family's in LA so like I yeah. get this peace but it's at the at the cost of not being around my parents you know mm. and it's not, you know, seven years are a long time. I just opened my eyes recently and was like, oh my God, it's almost been a decade. Like my parents have right. been kind of living with me on FaceTime for like almost a decade now. 
it sounds a lot like, you know, you have the liberation and the freedom when you're in India. There's yeah. a little bit more, I wouldn't say trapping is the right word, but there's definitely the expectations are different when, when you're in the States. And yeah. as a rapper, as a musician, as even like sort of building the persona, right? Because in the mm. end, it is about expressing your art. It's about being yourself. It's finding that Shanti. Mm. Is it almost in some ways as you now continue to build as an artist and especially as especially as um, a female artist is mm. it almost necessary to have to exude ego and swagger and showcase confidence as an <laughs> element of your brand and even especially that in that way like see the lucky thing i've understood is as a classical dancer i play these roles and yeah. I think in the beginning when I started, I really believed that character was who I was, you know? And I, I am Raja Kumari. Yes, my yeah. name is Sweta. I made Raja Kumari. But what I understood now is it was a defense mechanism. It's a character that I built to cut people's heads off that were going to hurt my inner child, you know? It yeah. was Maisha Suramardini. It was Satya Bama, Draupati, Sita, Madhuri, you know, Sushmita, Aishwarya. Yeah. Like every single amazing woman that I set my eyes on, I collected them into Raja Kumari. And mm. she was the defender of culture because I saw a world where my culture was dying and I just like didn't want to be a part of that. Like I thought it was so much more important to learn about Hanuman and Arjun than Superman and Batman. Like they right. were just not of interest to me, you know? So I think like now that I've like, you know, after the pandemic, I feel like I really had time to slow down. And like, I realized like how much I was pushing, pushing, pushing. And when you're pushing, 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 you know, you're not allowing trust in God into the moment, like into the situation. Like people who perceive me in, in the West and it's not their fault because I haven't been present to right, like right. be there to yeah. like, you know, do like my food giveaways or whatever. Like, you know, I haven't, they haven't seen me do my charity work. They haven't seen anything. They've just seen this character who yeah. cuts people's heads off, you know? So I'm happy, you know, like, just like Kali, you know, Devi has Kali where it's like bloodthirsty, you know, demon killer. And then there's the Shanti side of it, you know, yeah. where you see her just the benevolent. Saraswati version. Yeah, yeah. The Saraswati version, the Ganga Devi. Yeah. And I feel like as a woman, I am all these things. And as an artist, yeah. I am all these things. So I just feel like in the West, I hope to get, let people get to know me, my musicality. Like I became a rapper because as a singer, I wasn't cutting through and rapping was easy to me. The second yeah. I started rapping, people paid attention. So I leaned into it and I love hip hop. Like I, I grew up on Lauryn Hill. So I didn't know there was a difference between singing and rapping. I just thought sure. it was all expression, you know? Yeah. So I think if you listen to this album, by the time you get to the second half, by the time you get to Fearless, those are pop songs that I would have tried to pitch to the biggest, like, you know, get Beyonce or Rihanna, someone to sing them because yeah. at that time I didn't have value enough in myself that I could be the person to sing these incredible songs. I knew I could write them mm. and I did for other people, but to be the person to sing it was a journey, you know? So now I'm hoping through this album, through coming to America, through, you know, being more present there, being available that, you know, I can dispel this this idea that I'm just that one character because it's not right for those that look up to me too because they're going to have to sure. go through the exact same journey with me that they're going to get hyper on their masculine kill, like, you know, this, this energy and then get burned out and then have to go seek the soft side and then find the balance. And that's why, like, you know, everyone that knows me knows that I'm about, like, this full or the not yeah. even balance, there you, you go. know? Yes. <laughs> but this only came in 21, you know? It's been a journey. For, for Sveta... There's obviously a, a true centered spirituality here. Is Raja Kumari equally spiritual and, and evoking that same kind of balance? Are they one? Raja the Kumari is a vessel of the goddess. Like I yeah. learned to become the goddess on stage. When you're a normal person, then you become Devi. Yeah. You know? So I literally. To me, when I go on stage as her, it comes, I just like, my friends say like, there's like a thing that comes over me and then I walk on stage and I'm somebody else. And it's because I literally welcome the goddess and I personify like a modern Devi. Yes, I'm a human being. Yes, the things I'm saying are different. But when I'm there, the way that I'm looking at the audience, that's how I would play Devi. That's, but it's a modern Devi. So for me, it's just a vessel. It's just, it's like, there's no difference between playing 
Mahishasura Mardini Devi and Raja Kumari. They're the same. They're like coming for the patriarchy. Let me ask you this. And, and you talked about the bridge um, a little bit. And and I was curious when I when I listen to the album and when I'm thinking about like sort of like the display on stage and I listen to Born to Win and I seem like, you know, hey, it's sort of like this great ode to doing this very effortlessly. And there's a lot of declaration there. And then I listen to No Nazar and it's, you know, a lot of sort of like, you know, fearless warnings. And it's sort of like, look, there, there's a mess, obvious message there. And then, and then I hear fearless and it seems so much more, like you said, reflective. And there's so much, um, there's such deepness, you know, to it. Is it simply easier to find comfort and ease in in showing those many sides of you and all the different multiplicity that you just talked about is this what maturity is like as an artist (laughs) yeah i think this is my first mature album but you see the growth like you see it start with babylon like and uh you know babylon was the first record that i wrote during the pandemic so you could hear the fear of the world and god can you hear me i'm in this dark place i don't know what to do No Nazar was written as like a protection spell because I was, you know, exiting a lot of toxicity, toxic people, toxic situations, toxic, you know, business relationships, everything had to go. And that was like something that I wrote and and sing to literally cast like, I'm like, if anyone listens to this, they're protected. That that was Mm. the goal. Like, because we listened to mantrams, we listened to pujas, repetition. And I was like... Everything is about like applying what I know about spiritual, the world into this modern space. And like the choice, like my parents like sent the video to like my family and I was like, oh my God, there's so many F-bombs. Like, what are we going to do? But they've understood (laughs) that like, this is like a, it's like, that's the language of the vernacular. Like sometimes you have to say things in a certain way for people to hear you, you know? So there's just, just like in our, our sacred texts do the same thing, right? There's a Sanskrit and there's a Prakrit. So yeah. like, you know, there's the, there's the Sanskrit version of a lot of these things, but it's, you know, the language of the people might be Hindi or Marathi yeah. or Telugu. Exactly. And, you know, the you vernacular, have to be, yeah. the vernacular is important. Um, yeah. And, I and imagine this is that, the vernacular of today, yeah. you know, like this you know? is it. But I feel like what happened halfway through the album was, you know, one year, I think like by June, July was when they let us go outside, I think. And so I started yeah. like being more in nature. And also I, you know, I was really detoxing a lot of toxicity out of my life. And I think I started to find self-love when we got to juice mm. and then love sick, then colors. And I think like, those are my first love songs that I've ever released. And I realized yeah. that when I was making them, I was like, wow, like I had made this character that well, it's literally, I was just stuck on this one demon slaying, patriarchy slaying goddess of fire and, and fury. Yeah. And that's why I felt burnt out. So then the second half of the album is nourishing that feminine side. And also, you know, I have a, I have another project that I worked on, you know, that I have music that's ready to go, yeah. but that music was so grounded in my femininity yeah. that this album had to come out. Sure. Like it had to bridge you into my new sound. So that's why like by the end of the album, you're in this place, like I hope of, of hope. Fearless is a very special song. And then, I, I and love that song. That track just really is is very special. And it just seems like it's it's such a collection of uh, a lot of your thoughts and expressions in a way that just seems so fitting for all the stuff you're sharing right now. You're listening to Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing. After a quick break, let's come back to our conversation with Raja Kumari. Stay tuned. Conversation. It's the antidote to apathy and the catalyst for relationships. I'm Abhay Dandekar, and I share conversations with global Indians and South Asians, so everyone can say, trust me, I know what I'm doing. New episodes weekly, wherever you listen to your podcasts. Hi, I'm Lily Singh, and you're listening to Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing. Hi there, I'm Abhay Dandekar, and you're listening to Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing. Let's now rejoin our conversation with hip-hop artist, singer, and performer, Raja Kumari. 
I, I'm curious. I am curious about one thing. You know, you we talked about this last time, and you mentioned it now. And you know, there's for a lot of of women and men, and and for that matter, you know, anyone out there, any person yeah. is seemingly on a quest. Often at at you know a certain point in their lives to find their person, and you know to raise a family or or be a part of you know some sort of collective so to speak right that's that's mm. the sort of either norm they've built in their head or it's just a yearning that they have just like that do you feel like the quest to find your person to build your family uh, is is that a yearning it's a desire it's a desire because i think a desire works better with manifestation because when i say i want something i feel like a like I don't quite deserve it. But when I desire it, it's like, I'm just asking God, if God wants to give me them, it's the best, you know, I just desire it. But I think now, I mean, I'm someone who like, I'm a religious studies major. Like, obviously I have a lot of respect for like, you know, the things I've read. And I just feel like I'm, I'm a little delayed on the timeline, but I feel like I'm in that householder phase. Like I've done so much of the, of the learning and now it's just like there's there's other experiences in human experience that you're supposed to have. You know, like yeah. you have this whole thing and we're in the Kali Yoga and I'm sure you've heard about dating in this world. It is so yeah. crazy these days. Yes. And it is it's it's weird and it's not what our parents, you know, told us it was gonna be like. And I always tell my friends that are like ten years older than me, like you guys are lucky. Like you guys yeah. did this in a time where it wasn't just options like this. Yes, you no know swiping. Yeah, no swiping and people understood commitment. And I still have faith. I like I was writing my journal and I was like, I no matter what this world does to me, I still believe in love. I still yeah. believe that it's possible to have a monogamous relationship, which I think yeah. monogamy is like a word people can't even say anymore. Right, it's like not right. cool to say monogamy. It's like open relationships or nothing. Yeah. But I think like I don't know. I just feel like what a challenge that would be to build something with someone. What a new way that I could learn more about myself. What it would be like sure. to bring like life onto this earth. And like, I've been only thinking about myself and my visions. And what would it be like to all of a sudden it not be about me? How different would I be as a human? How could I be used to serve God in different ways? So I think mm. I like desire it because it feels like, the natural next chapter. Like, I just feel like I'm a little bit, all these amazing things are happening and they're incredible. And I've worked so hard for them, but then you're just kind of like enjoying them alone, which I don't know is, 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 I don't know if that's the purpose. Is there comfort as, you know, as someone who's an artist and you Mm -hmm. live some life in celebrity and, Mm -hmm. and by the way, I, I, I absolutely uh, make it a point on, you know, these conversations to avoid like tabloidy stuff. But but is there is there some comfort in sharing the vulnerability of saying that, like, I have this desire? Um, I just say it now because I got to manifest it. I talk to Simon D. I'd be talking to everybody because <laughs> I'm telling you, Bumble doesn't work for me because if I go on Bumble, then people screenshot it and they're like, Raja Kumari, someone's using your pictures. I'm like, no, right. it's me. It's really and like, me. I, it's actually me. And yeah. then like, you know, Raya is like a weird thing because I feel like leading with your celebrity is really strange to me because yeah. I don't want someone who's trying to see how they can use me to like, I don't know. I find it weird. So, and it's okay. Like I'm not going to satisfy any of the traditional Indian, you know, time stamps right. I'm supposed to reach. Yeah. But I mean, at this point, I'm just looking for somebody that would enjoy going to see temples with me and would like want to see more. I think that's the other thing is that I really love India. I think that's something I've just like come mm. to understand that this isn't a means to an end. Like, I yeah. just feel like, I think maybe maybe this tour might make me change my mind on America a little bit more. Maybe I yeah. might feel more, you know, welcomed and see that I can have value and that people are actually receptive to like the things I want to do, you know, for humanity. Like if yeah. if that changes, otherwise, you know, I like being here. I like I like opening my eyes in the motherland. Are you hoping to be surprised by that? I mean, like you're no you're no foreigner in that way, right? To to what the American audience is going to be like. But given the fact that this is new music, a new tour, you know, kind of a reintroduction in in, in a way, is is there going to be sort of a surprise element to this, no matter what? I mean, there's always going to be some discovery for everyone involved. But are you kind of hoping that you might be surprised by what the response is? 
I'm always surprised. I think like, I remember I did some shows in 2019 that we had like done by ourselves. So they weren't routed yeah. by a proper agency. So I don't have any data to like prove that people right. care, you know? So yeah. this is my first like data driven tour, you know, that's yeah. why I'm hoping everybody buys tickets soon. Yeah. So my agents can understand the way things actually are. But, um, <laughs> No, I mean, like, I think, like, every time I'm in America, I am so moved. And I actually, you know, I spent time saying, like, oh, I don't feel needed. But I do feel how needed I am. You know, I do feel the yeah. impact of my words. And, you know, when I watch, like, videos with young girls doing classical dance, fusion, like, you know, for my tour, I opened up an uh, open call for classical dance teams, fusion dance teams, like, people who want to dance with me to submit videos because... I literally started making fusion music because I didn't have fusion music to dance to right, for my right. college stuff. So like, I really wanted to reach out to the Indian clubs and the colleges cause I was the president. Like I'm yeah. really just like, you know, I feel like when I see that, I'm just so happy, you know, to be a part of that. I hope it becomes easier for me to connect with people. Yeah. I hope more people know about me so that when I come, I can perform, I can be there, you know, but um, I'm just not, someone who wants to chase and push beyond what feels right anymore. Like I yeah. would, I, I'm willing to put the work in the work is never a question. I would mm. work constantly for this forever. I just, um, there's a lot of dark things going on on earth. There's a lot of stuff happening and I know that I am the light. So when yeah. things push against me, I understand that there's deeper things at play. But I sure. do see a young Indian girl when I see like, you know, Maitreyi and I see like what's happened with Never Have I Ever and the way that these young kids have representation and how they're taking that and they're expressing things that I would be so scared to express when I was growing up because we didn't have that kind of like comfort. And I'm very optimistic, you know, I'm well, so happy to see that. And that and this generation in some ways, like those kids who are at a stage where they're receptive to this and they can, and it resonates really powerfully for them because they do have, you know, pretty easy access to yeah. people who look like them, people who are yes. sounding like them, that they're I mean, integrating there's, there's models opening Gucci and Versace and they're idiots. Yeah. Like we didn't have this, right, you right. know, we did not have this. And, and because of that ease, and, you know, perhaps as they get to know your music and as they come to your shows and they really experience this, I mean, in that way, I can only imagine that they'll they'll have that much more comfort in knowing that, like, wow, this is someone who, you know, no pun intended, is the godmother of this kind of, yeah. um, you know, uh, style. The, the funniest thing now is, like, do you see how I look now, like where I, how yeah. I've become? And the character I'm on stage is, like, the opposite. Like, it's, right. rah, it's rah, you know? It is my like, Shah Surmadini, yeah. It's super my Shah. Like, I'm in my peaceful Devi state, and then they call right. me, and it's like, I'll oh, come. Let's go, and, yeah. and I'm just laughing because this generation is getting to know, like, this sadhu version of myself, where before I was just, like, only thug, like, straight yeah. thug life. And now I'm like talking about Shanti. I'm recording like a prayer album. Like I'm on this other zone, but on stage, that character has to be there because we're still fighting against patriarchy. We're still fighting against, you know, um, misrepresentation. We're still fighting for so many people, for so many things, you know, like our, our voices have to be used, you know, to speak against injustice. That's what musicians do. That's what artists do, you know? I wonder about one thing. I wonder if like being very aware of that centered Shanti side of you actually makes the persona on stage and ready to fight the fight that much more powerful. Like, do you <laughs> actually derive energy from that? I do because I think now I get a little break from it in regular life where before I was constantly right. like, I would wake up and yeah. write all the things. I got to conquer these people. Now I'm just like, what does God <laughs> want me to do today? You know, right, he wants me right. to see something like, OK, what would you like me to observe, Lord, so that I can integrate it into my character? Like, you know, everything is a lot calmer now. And yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll be I'll have to see, you know, it, like I've become calmer yeah. and crazier things are happening. Like, I'll just say something out loud, like I want to meet the Ambani's. And then the next day I'll yeah. be shaking all of their hands, you know, so it, it like, it's just yeah, it's coming. The manifestation 
and the visualizations, everything is coming faster now that I'm calmer. You know, as things are calmer, as things are more reflective, and yet the energy and the fight is still there and the persona still is 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 quite powerful and empowering to so many others, right? S- some know you as Sveta and many, many more know you as Rajakumari, but those are those worlds are are merging even more yeah. so as you mentioned, right? So now yes. as you evolve and you find that peace and you also find the power, um, do you find that more and more that Sveta and Raja Kumari are growing more integrated or closer? Yes. And yes. they're uniquely, or, or, or for that matter, are there personas that are uniquely distinct and you kind of have to keep them that way? Or is it important, in fact, to have that kind of integration? I think like the rise of Sveta, like this me coming back into myself was really when I went independent, you know, when I left the major label system, because I was having situations where people were trying to make decisions for me, speak on my behalf. And I had to be like, hi, my name is Sveta Rao. I am the senior most representative of the brand Raja Kumari on planet Earth. I created her as a 14 year old in my room and I have brought her to this position of influence. So if you want to speak on my behalf, you have to speak to me. And that empowerment and like, you know, leaving Nas, leaving Mass Appeal, leaving the major label. And then now like leaning on myself to fund everything. You know, it's Mm. funny. I was actually doing an interview and someone for Sherniai and they were like, how could they not use you as a writer when you're such a writer? Who is this Svetha Rao? I was like, it's (laughs) me. (laughs) Like, Surprise. Yeah, I've started listing... You know, my my songwriting credits in the past had always said Raja Kumari because yeah. I wanted, I didn't want people to have to learn two Indian names. I was like, just learn right. the one that's going to go towards my music. But now everything like post Godmother, like since I have taken a stand and understood, you know, who was really behind all of this was me. Yeah. You know, yeah. now I've been crediting State the Rao as a writer and just letting people know that I'm behind this and this is one of the characters and there'll be many more and there'll be other versions of baby like god is multifaceted and so am i you know like this is how it's going to I be i love it well i know that all the multifaceted versions and the people who not only are are huge fans but also those who are just getting introduced to you they're getting they're feeling the power and they're also feeling the peace and all of that all of which and you stand I, and i'm for. feeling the love and i honestly am feeling the love honestly cuz like yeah. you know that experience at the temple and just knowing that like I've just been looking in the wrong place for people to accept me. And like, I just yeah. want to like expand the vision and the imagination. And I, and I just hope more people just come to see the musicality. Cause at yeah. the end of the day, before the fashion, before the Bollywood and all these things, it was about making something on the altar for Saraswati, you know? And so mm-hmm. I hope that people come and hear the music behind it and hear what I've done with it. And hopefully come with me on the journey because the next project is very self-reflective. It's very like different and, and it's more in this space, but I'll never, you know, stop cutting off the heads of demons. It's always going to be the very important part of my life. So if that's what you love me for, I guarantee I will always cut demons heads off. Don't worry. We, we love you for the peace and for slaying <laughs> and for slaying. So, yes, um, both. <laughs> Raja, thank you so much for, you, for joining us. What a, what a terrific conversation. I hope we can visit with you again down the road. Of course, I would love. I mean, anytime that I see, you know, the request for, to speak to you, I'm like, I get to talk to my friend. Thanks so much. And please check out Raja Kumari on tour this month and her music, of course, wherever you might be streaming. Again, any kind sharing or rating or review is always appreciated. Until next time, I'm Abhay Dandekar.